All right, so we are here talking with Diana Wolf. Um, she has just come off recently racing Ironman Boulder. Um, she's done eight half Ironman races and four foals. Um, and her 2018 race schedule is Ironman Haines City 70.3, so we did that back in April. Uh, Ironman Boulder did a foal in June, uh, one of the hottest days of the year out there. Uh, she has a half Ironman in Santa Rosa on July 28th coming up very quickly. Um, and then we've got a local uh, sprint on August 25th, and then Ironman Louisville is kind of wrapping up the season October 14th. Uh, so Diana is an environmental health and safety officer from the University of Akron College of Polymer Science and Engineering. That is a mouthful. And then she is also a, a firefighter and paramedic for Highland Hills Fire Department. So um, she's got plenty going on. And how many fur babies do you have? I have three fur babies. Three fur babies, and how many real babies? No, one baby. Yep. So the, <laughs> He's 27, grown man. Yeah, but sometimes it, it requires as much attention as the fur babies, right? Um, but, Not as much anymore. He's pretty self -sufficient. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I've been uh, kind of talking with Diana as she's gone through her process of racing these, uh, doing these races. Um, just full disclosure, I am a triathlon coach. I'm not necessarily coaching Diana. We've just been kind of talking about, you know, her experiences, and she's asked me a few questions. Um, so for Ironman Boulder, she was self-coached and, and did a plan and did that race. Um, I did create a plan for her for, uh, for Louisville, so she's kind of trying that out. We'll see how that goes. But uh, full disclosure, uh, we're not, I'm, I'm not, uh, we're not doing a, like a one-on-one -on -one coaching or anything, but I just uh, thought her, her story was interesting. And, Kind of what she's gone through to do her races because it's a little bit unique because um, she's doing the uh, Ironman races in full firefighter gear. Um, so she is the first woman, correct, to do this for a full Ironman race, right, Dan? That's correct. So, um, yeah. and we'll, I'll let her talk a little bit more about it, but uh, her site, rescue4ptsd.com, a uh, campaign to raise awareness for firefighters with PTSD and reduce the stigma of the, the sign of PTSD. Um, so if you want to take a few minutes just to kind of talk about that, uh, I'd like people to hear about that and kind of what you're spending your time on. So for me, I was a, I'm a survivor of PTSD for about 10 years. It was pretty debilitating for me. Um, my doctor, she wanted me to get out and do things that I like to do, get uh, involved in something. And so I joined a multi-sport group of women, and they kind of led me down the triathlon path. And the more I did uh, triathlon, the longer I did triathlon, uh, the longer races, um, I found a lot of healing, uh, built a lot of confidence. Um, it distracted a lot of my issues that I was having with the PTSD. So I wanted to use Ironman as a platform to let other firefighters know that they can come out and say that they have PTSD, that you're not weak. Um, it's just something that happens to us while we're on the job. It's not something that we do wrong. Um, and I just want them to be more open about it because there's a big stigma to keep it quiet that you have it or you're having problems because it makes you weak. So I use what is healing for me to hopefully help others find an avenue for themselves to find some healing. And we're going to raise money for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation to help build programs that reduce that stigma or bring out the awareness that it's okay to say you have PTSD. And I think you said your goal was $25,000 for that, and it concludes with Ironman Louisville? Yes. And what, are you, what yes. how far are, are you to your goal? Uh, we're quite a way still. We, we're, we're just over $8,000. Um, we found that our triathlon's a little harder to fundraise with, at least for my aspect, because it's not like a firefighter just passed away. It's an ongoing problem, so it's not real. It's not as uh, emotionally sensitive right away. So, um, you know, we're looking for uh, corporate sponsors along the way, and we're going to start out with uh, out at Santa Rosa. There you go. And and but you have made a significant impact, and I think and Iron Man's kind of picked up on your story and done a few videos with that as well. So hopefully, uh, gain a little. Uh, momentum going into to Ironman Louisville and Santa Rosa, but just want to also throw that out there that you know, my wife was a, a critical transport nurse for a while for children, um, so she she had the same issues. I mean, it's there when you see traumatic issues, whether it be firefighters, police officers, you know, first responders. 
um, it's not just one, you know, first responder community. So, you know, when you're helping one, you're helping them all. So, um, I definitely kind of personal, personally see the, the aftermath that can have on people. So I definitely appreciate you out there, you know, raising funds and awareness. Um, kind of getting back into the, the, the topic at hand is kind of talking about your experience in Ironman Boulder. Um, there's been a lot of questions. This year was extremely hot, which is not as typical for Boulder. Usually it's kind of warm in the summer, um, but not to the point of the triple digits. Um, and it's not it's not the humid heat, it's the humidity, as Ark's saying here in Kansas City. Uh, but that's not the case for Colorado, but it can be deceiving. So I just wanted you to kind of go through your, your day uh, in a nutshell of, you know, the swim, the bike, the run, and, and kind of a, a summary of, how long it actually took because you kind of went over the 17 hours, but still you finished it. So I just kind of want you to uh, take us through that the day and how that went for you. Um, well, I was say like to start the day before because it'll come back a little later in the conversation. But the uh, day before, everyone talked about you know hydrate so much more because of the altitude, and I kind of got peer pressured into that. I'm not a you know person who hydrates a lot, a lot, a lot uh, before a race i just kind of keep to my normal day maybe add another bottle uh but for, for this race i hydrated it even more because everyone said oh the altitude you may need extra water so i was well into that mode uh before the race race morning i felt great the whole week i felt better than ever going into the race so uh, i was pretty confident the course was after we drove it was uh, really conducive to my type of riding and um, so, you know, race morning, felt good, relaxed, we got in the swim. Um, uh, I have to say a little unprepared, a little or less unprepared for uh, the swim, but um, I knew I could make the distance, um, just not at the speed, but it was my goal to race a little slower than normal to make sure I had that energy for the run um, with the extra gear because the gear is about 37 pounds so I wanted to scale it back a little bit not race as hard so um, got in a swim the water is great I love it a little cooler so that was awesome um, I was really cool coming out about a mile into it I, I felt a little fatigued but um, it was good went through transition no problems got on the bike um, about my mile 30 it seemed like from most of the race posts mile 30 seemed to get a lot of people um, I started uh, feeling the heat about mile 30, and I obviously continued to feel that throughout the race. Um, at about uh, mile 80, I stopped, and I um, stopped to just take a break because I just did the my bike thermometer. I don't know what everybody else has said, but mine said 101 the whole time I was out there. Um, the winds were pretty rough, um, but. Uh, uh, I took a break, and unfortunately, I never done it before. But I vomited because it was. It seemed like I was able to. I have a speed fill, and I had that full of water, and then I have two nutrition bottles on the back. And it seemed like just because of the way the terrain, um, the heat getting to me, that um, I wasn't able to reach back, or wasn't as willing to reach back and get that nutrition as much. So I was depending a lot. I kept drinking from the speed fill. But I knew I was a little behind uh, on sodium and, and um, uh, calories. And it just kind of continued to decline from there. And um, when I came into transition, um, I thought I was pretty, I was kind of delirious, uh, very overheated. And I knew at this point I was probably, you know, 1,200 calories behind. Um, and then the bike actually took me an extra hour, so add another 300 onto that. That was really behind on calories. And um, so thankfully for my training partner, my uh, rescue for T PTSD teammate, Natalie, um, she was there and she was like, let's just go. Let's just start walking, see what we can do, like finish the story. Because the goal really was to, just to finish the distance. So um, we just started walking. I kept the helmet off. The helmet contains so much heat for me, so I kept the helmet off. And I knew at that point how much I had to, from experience, how much I had to get back with sodium and calories. Um, 
you know, starting at the first aid station right off the bat. Normally I, I'll drink like a Coca-Cola at mile 18. Well, I made a joke and said, well, it's starting at, at, at uh, the first mile aid station. <laughs> so we just kept kind of uh, pushing through it. I started to feel that I knew I had a lot of water and didn't balance it with the sodium on the bike. So I started to feel um, hypernatremic from the extra, extra water that I had, I had, had. and um, so I immediately started drinking chicken broth to try and get back on the sodium. And I felt the uh, some pressure in my bladder area, which is a good sign for me that I'm having some issues. And I just kept that at every aid station, just kept bringing down the, the chicken broth and what I could, what I could handle taking in uh, to try and fight my way back. And eventually at about, well, I'd say about mile eight, I was feeling much better and I could tell that I was regaining my uh, nutrition back. So, but again, it was a really focused on just getting it back in forward motion, just keeping going was the whole goal. I just kept going. So we continued and we continued it more. And um, I think it was about mile, um, I think we're about mile 16, I think, is when we got kind of uh, had our chip timing chip taken away because we weren't going to make the cutoff. And they said, well, there'd be no more race support. Um, we did talk to a few key um, aid stations, asked them, hey, we're going to continue. Can you leave us some chicken broth, water, and ice at a certain location right by there? And they all were great volunteers and said, no problem. So we had access to that. Um, one aid station gave us headlamps, thankfully, because we would have never made it without those headlamps. Um, and we just ended up hiking in pitch dark. And we just continued. They did send us, they came looking for us at one point, because at this point I was doing about 20 minutes a mile. Um, it just, you know, the gear and the, the end of the day just tore me up. But um, uh, to be able to carry that gear, but uh, we just kept going. And and we there was nobody left to finish line with the Iron Man the BC Live uh, video crew, which is great to stick by me and uh, uh, stay there for me, um, and uh, at least we get it on tape that we at least finished the time, or at least we finished the distance in about 19 hours and 22 minutes. Yeah, that's definitely a long day. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, I think was, Natalie I mean, and Natalie almost fell asleep while she was walking. <laughs> yeah, I. I you know, I did Boulder in 2015. I did in like 1248 or something like that. But yeah, at the end of that race, I was, you know, that's, that's an early morning, a long day. And I was, I was gassed just after, you know, not wearing a bunch of firefighter gear on the, the run slash walk, jog, whatever I was doing. So, you know, definitely yeah. you know, props to you for, you know, sticking to it, getting it done. And I think kind of talk to you, the goal is to maybe, you know, hopefully Ironman Louisville is a little bit cooler and uh, maybe get a little bit more uh, speedy on the swim and the, and the bike to, to give enough time to allow for that run to finish in the cutoff time. I think, I think it's 17 hours for the result. I know some are a little bit shorter. But. Yeah. We felt really confident after at least being able to finish that day, considering mm -hmm. the conditions that, you know, like I said, it was like an hour over my slowed, you know, bike time that I planned on riding slower at. And I was still an hour over that. So we cut some of that out in a slow transition that we did. Um, uh oh, did we lose you? Oh, there we go. The video's a little fuzzy on you. Oh. All right, back. Yep. All right. Hi. Level IT difficult research. Um, but anyway, I kind of want to focus on two. You know, there's there's a lot of people that kind of you know when they hear Boulder, they think, oh my gosh, altitude. And, you know, it's you know Mile High City, Denver, and all that kind of stuff. You know, and I did a little survey in the group, and uh, you know most contributed their issues to the heat. And you know, people are talking about, uh oh, need to move. I know. I don't. The the light went off. Hold on. <laughs> I wasn't moving enough, apparently. Got to stay green over there. Um, yeah. But it kind of goes to, you know, a lot of people worry about Boulder and do I need to go out and do I need it acclimated? And, 
you know, kind of some of my points is, you know, it's maybe a 10% loss in the, the deficiency of, of which you can absorb the oxygen you use in your body, depending on what study you want to read. But really, to make an adaptation, it takes more than being out there for a week or two. You know, it takes being out there for months like the professional athletes do. So from your vantage point, do you think altitude really played much a role in, in any kind of fatigue situations or did you feel like out shortness of breath? And I think, well, we were out there in April doing some training um, and we did 30 miles on the bike um, on the course, the first part of the course, and um, we didn't have any effect whatsoever from the altitude. And um, I'm from the Cleveland, Ohio area. So, you know, we're about 1,500 feet. Um, so there's a significant difference. But um, I, I think it was more or less the, the high heat with maybe the altitude that was more of the problem for me, if not just the heat. So um, did I think it played a part of it? Yeah, I did. But um, I don't think it would have it was if it wasn't for the, the, the high heat circumstances. Because actually, in all honesty, once I got onto the, the run, I didn't have any problems with my heart rate. It was just fatigue from the, the heat. Yeah, and like I said, I did in 2015, and that's when they had the date switch. So it was actually August 4th for the full. And, you know, it, got, it was probably high 80s. Um, it was pretty warm, and, you know, dehydration got me on the run, and I was cramping here and there. And, you, know, you just don't think about coming from a humid area, how much that heat will just suck off the moisture off of you, and you don't realize it until you look at you and recover it in salt, you know, from the sweat just evaporating because it doesn't stay on you, and you're just not covered in sweat, feeling wet, and you realize you know, I'm losing a lot. You need to drink some water, drink some water. So I think that's key is, is especially for your circumstances, you're out there. You know, you do the swim and the bike in regular gear, and then or the fire break, you're on the run. You know, if if the altitude um, you know, stigmatism is going to be there, that's when I would think you'd have the most impact. Is you'd be out there, you know, gasping for air, dying on the ground because you just, you know, the the air's thin and there's not enough oxygen, which just really isn't the case. It's it's more of a, you know, if you train properly, if you follow your plan, you know. Did you do the work beforehand before you came out there? Maybe come out a two to three days before, like you said, hydrate but not overhydrate. I always tell people it's like stay on top of your hydration like you normally would, but don't go overboard because, like you said, that hypernatremia is a real. You know, if you have an imbalance. Yeah, and I think. Fluids. I and I actually think that was the worst part was I went into it overhydrated, and I said from now on I'm just gonna stick with my regular game plan and maybe just one extra bottle. Um, if I would do it at racing altitude again, I just, I think I was already overhydrated going into it. Yeah, and it might be more of an impact maybe because people, um, you know, especially when I was a kid, we did spring break and went skiing. So you fly up and then you drive up to the mountains. That's probably going to be more of a significant increase because Boulder's not in the mountains. It's in the foothills. I think a lot of people have the stereotype of, oh, Boulder, I'm going to be in the mountains. It's like, no, you're, you're in the foothills right before the, the mountain range um, there is an altitude difference but you're not like skiing in, in you know copper mountain or vale or winter park or any place like that you know up there it's probably going to make an impact on you um, so if you're going to do an extreme race out there then yeah you probably want to get some altitude adjustment but for boulder i just want another you know vantage point a case study like yours kind of drive home the point it's not the altitude that gets you it's the same thing as all the other races it's you know energy management. It's the heat. It's the hydration. It's nutrition. You know, if you get behind on that, it's it's all these things that are the reoccurring theme for every race. No matter if it's sea level, I'm in Florida, or it's mile high, it, and I'm in Boulder. So I, that, um, I I'll be honest. It was the rough of the rough day that I had at Ironman Boulder. Um, I thought my day at Ironman or Haines City, the half was 10 times harder than Boulder was uh, because of the humidity. Yep. Um, I could not keep my heart rate down at, at Haines City. It, would, it just kept going up, and I would have to stop being in the fire gear and let it come down because I didn't want to uh, overheat um, and get heat strokes, so we paid real close attention to that. And um, whereas 
you know, once I got walking, I, I just didn't have the heart rate problem I did at, at Haines City in, in Boulder because of the drier heat, which I was actually more concerned about with this race was it being drier because when I did go out there for a training ride, uh, I was really thirsty. But um, so I was actually more concerned about the dryness of the air and being thirsty all the time versus um, the altitude going into this race. Right, and and, that, and I think that's a good point. Is is more of the, you know, it depends on where you're training. Training in Florida is going to be a little different out in Colorado. Training in Kansas City is going to be different. If you're training out in Colorado, then you're all set. Um, but if you're training, you know, California, if you're Minnesota, you know, Houston, Dallas, wherever you're at, um, just be prepared. It is going to be dry heat, and you may not feel the effects immediately. But you know, it's it's the same story: hydration, nutrition training just be ready for race day yeah um, and, and like i said the more, the more you know about you the better you are because i knew exactly what i needed to do to get back just from experience exactly and that's what you you know after your eight halves and four fulls i mean you definitely have the experience out there um i just want to follow up you know before we run out of time um do you have any words of advice for the half people i know we've kind of hit a few points you know it's Hydrate, but don't overhydrate. You know, stay on top of your nutrition. Um, is there anything else you might, uh, you know, all the people that oh, go out and acclimate for a week or two weeks before or anything like that? What What would you recommend for somebody coming out and doing the half without firefighter gear? Well, one thing I usually always say is, unless you're a pro, you're not really getting you're not getting paid to do this. So just run your race. If you've got to slow it back, like I did, I slowed it back even more than I thought I was going to. Um, but it was, it was about either finishing or doing the best that you can for that day or uh, managing it to get to as the farthest point you can for that day. Um, it's just forward, uh, relentless forward progress. Um, we have that motto on our team that's just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Um, I can't tell you how many times I stopped on the, on the run because I was just fatigued with the gear. And um, I just sat, took a break, and said, you know, if it takes us all night, it's going to take us all night, but we're going to get the distance done. And I would feel good and keep going again, but then my muscles were tired and we'd stop and take a break again. But just keep moving, um, you know, and, and be open to, if you're all liquid nutrition, which I am, I was open to eating at every aid station to catch back up. Whatever was going to help me, whatever I could get down and keep down, I was continuing with. So, but be open to those other options. Or trying avenues, different avenues on the on the course at that time. If you're having a rough time, if something's not working, try something else. But uh, you know, I just think more of it is really ninety percent. It's ninety percent mental, ten percent, you know, physical, and just keep going. After all, you paid a lot of money to run the race. You might as well keep going. That's right. I remember some of the race times. It's like remember you paid to do this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so kind of wrapping it up, um, I did want to kind of, um, give another, uh, shout out to, to the fundraising you're doing for the website, www.rescueforpptsd.com for anybody that wants to follow up and I'll put that in the comment section or the, the video title so people can follow up on that and, and donate, you know, a dollar, ten dollars, whatever people feel free to donate, you know, feel, feel uh, driven to donate, you know, I'm sure that Diana would appreciate. Um, any, any other uh, things you want to put in there for, for uh, rescue4psd.com or any other party, party with them? Um Well, we are, we, are, we are raffling off a sauna, uh, one person jacuzzi brand infrared sauna. Um, you can go to our website and uh, buy a ticket. We're going to sell tickets for $20 a piece with a $3,500 sauna uh, sent direct to your house. And um, we'll uh, pull the winner the morning after uh, Louisville. Oh, there you go. And the infrared saunas are the, the latest craze in recovery. So that's a, that'd be a yes. pretty key addition for any uh, dedicated Ironman athlete. Yeah, we just um, really appreciate any support. Definitely. So, yeah, like I said, uh, I'll put the, that link in the uh, description of the video. So you can uh, jump on there and take it. Uh, uh, and you've also got t-shirts going on. So... Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to support the cause, uh, especially at Ironman Louisville, um, you know, if you're any part of the, the first responders, fire, firefighters, police, you know, emergency medical people, 
you know, if you want to support the cause out at Louisville, then uh, go grab the shirt or even, uh, like I said, Santa Rosa, July 28th, uh, you're going out there and you can pull a firefighter here. So um, it's probably not going to be as, you know, probably be a warm race too out there, I would imagine. Uh, some place, I think they hit 100 degrees last week, so it should be interesting for you. I've been watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I, I just want to say thanks to Diana for coming on and kind of sharing with them and told her story and kind of the, you know, uh, her, her uh, viewpoint from a very unique point of view being in, in gear like that. And, you know, it requires a little bit more, you know, than your standard Ironman run, you know, 26, 26 miles after your 112 mile bike ride. Um, so I think people will appreciate that kind of viewpoint of when you're going to extreme duress and stress on your body, you know, what's that altitude going to do? Um, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, sticking to your, your training plan like you planned all along. It's not necessarily, you don't have to do anything unique, like go out there for a month at a time or do a special trip, you know. It, it, but if, you, hey, if you've got the money and the time, you know, Boulder's not a bad place to go out and hang out for a while. But, um, you know, the trap on kind of expensive sport, so I don't think you should have that kind of free. I absolutely love the course. Yeah. Yeah, it's, the it course can be a bad awesome. course on the right day. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, with that, uh, we'll just, uh, we'll end our little, uh, video here and then, uh, we'll post it up on the, uh, website and share it around. So, uh, thanks for watching. Thank you.